Welcome to the uh, monthly webinar series in the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment. Today's speaker is Dr. Ying De Lu. My name is Matt Balhoff. I'm the director of the center. To learn more about the center, please visit our website. Uh, just a little bit more information about us. Uh, we are a research center at the University of Texas at Austin. We have uh, over 20 faculty and principal investigators, as you see here. In the center, we work on a variety of subsurface applications, apply several different technical disciplines and engineering tools as shown here. We collaborate with industry a lot of different ways, one of those being our industrial affiliates projects, which are listed here. The newest IAP is this bottom one, Carbon UT or Carbon Utilization Storage and Transportation. We had a webinar just last month on the subject it's posted on YouTube if you're interested. These webinars are informative industry driven webinars by researchers and collaborators in the center. Uh, generally, they're the first Friday of the month at 12 p.m. via Teams. However, all webinars will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, and so you can find them there. Uh, we do encourage you to attend these lives so that you can ask questions. Uh, the upcoming webinar is uh, by Dr. David DiCarlo that will be next month. Titled his talk is the physics of water blocking in tight formations. How to increase initial production and fracturing. So uh, again, today's webinar is by Dr. Ying De Lu and it's titled Wax Crystallization, Gelation and Deposition. A little bit more about Dr. Lu is that uh, he holds a bachelor's degree from Tsinghua University and a PhD from the University of Michigan, both in chemical engineering. He is currently an assistant professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering here at UT Austin. Prior to this role, he worked as a research associate at the University of Tulsa, uh, a faculty member of the China University of Petroleum in Beijing, and a postdoctoral researcher at Yale University. Dr. Liu's research interests include complex fluids, rheology, multi-phase flow, multi-scale modeling, and their applications in petroleum production and transportation. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to, to Dr. Liu, and please don't hesitate to ask questions uh, in the chat, either during the presentation or at the end of it. Thank you. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Inda Liu, and I am a new assistant professor um, of petroleum engineering, and I just joined UTPGE last fall. Um, and thank you for participating uh, this webinar, and I'm glad to have this opportunity to talk about my research. So this presentation today is about uh, wax crystallization, gelation, and deposition, uh, which is the work um, I have been doing in the last uh, couple of years. Um, I would like to start um, by talking about um, a general a background of oil and gas transportation and flow assurance. So we know the transportation systems um, play a very important role in oil and gas production. Uh, so when we are producing, we would pump oil out of the reservoir um, uh, all the way through the well bore up to the surface. And then the oil and the gas will flow through internal flow lines and the gathering lines uh, through different processing unit and then enter this long distance uh, transmission pipeline to the refinery for further processing. And one important thing we want to make sure during this process is, uh, is the continuous flow of oil and gas in the system. So there is a discipline called flow assurance to solve all of the issues uh, we will encounter um, during the flow process. Now the concept of flow assurance was proposed around 1990 uh, when offshore oil and gas was heavily explored. And at that time, people start to realize that it's necessary to have a more comprehensive understanding of the hydrocarbon flow just to make sure the entire flow system works. And since the concept of flow assurance has been uh, refined and modified by many experts in the industry, um, so here I listed several definitions, uh, but the common thing um, 
uh, I mean, in all the definitions here is a, the essence of flow assurance is just to guarantee the flow. And uh, you may be curious, so what could happen uh, during the transportation that can stop the flow? Um, so here are some common issues people see. So we could have the formation of deposit inside the pipeline, um, and the deposit could include organic deposit, such as wax, asphaltine, or hydrate. Uh, it could also include uh, inorganic deposit, such as scale. So the formation of those deposit can uh, reduce the effective flow area in the pipe and then block block the flow. And sometimes uh, when the when the oil being transported um, contains very complicated um, has very complicated complicated composition, then it could have uh, could have very high um, real, uh, well very high viscosity or very complex rheological behavior, so which makes it very difficult to be transported. On the other hand, we could have some erosion or corrosion issue that can threaten the uh, integrity of the system. And we also need to have a very good understanding of the transient and the steady uh, state flow situation in the pipe just to make sure the entire system works. So the flow assurance um, is aimed to tackle all these issues. Um, the goal is to understand uh, the mechanism of different phenomena involved and then to develop uh, effective ways to manage uh, those problems. So today my talk uh, focus on uh, one of the major uh, organic deposition issue, which is wax. So what wax can do to the, so the wax can be a huge problem to oil and gas production. So here I have a map uh, that shows uh, the breakout of wax issues around the world. So as you can see, um, we have Gulf of Mexico, uh, South America, uh, this is North Sea, and this is uh, Africa, and then uh, South Asia. It's basically uh, all over the place. So most of the major uh, oil field in the world have seen or have experienced uh, some degree of wax issue. Now, depending on where the issue occur, um, so the wax problems can reduce the permeability of the reservoir or cause damage to the formation. Uh, it can also alter uh, the composition and the rheological behavior of reservoir fluid um, and the wax precipitation uh, in the pipeline could cause additional strain uh, on pumping uh, equipment. Basically, we need to use more power to tra uh, transport uh, the oil and sometimes uh, the wax deposition could also block uh, the pipeline and the flow line and, uh, and then the, um, we could also have uh, some shut-in and restart failure due to wax gelation and wax uh, deposition. So, um, so what wax uh, can do to the system? Um, basically, we, we have seen many wax incidents in the past. Now, the most severe wax deposition issue reported so far um, occurred in the Staffa field in North Sea. Uh, so the situation was very terrible. It cannot be uh, remediated, so eventually the entire platform has to be abandoned with uh, overall uh, economic loss of over one billion dollars. And even for less severe wax issue, now the treatment uh, cost could go uh, easily go as high as about thirty million dollars. Um, so that's why people spend a lot of efforts in the last uh, couple of years trying to understand. Uh, the wax uh, deposition mechanisms and try to uh, have some effective ways to manage the wax issue. So now today in my presentation, um, I have selected three um, work I did in the past um, about wax. So as you can see, the, uh, the three projects target the wax from a little bit different perspective. The first one is about uh, wax deposition in subsea pipeline, and uh, the second one is about uh, uh, the wax gelation or the real rheological behavior of waxy oil, uh, which has application in shut-in and restart operations. 
And now the third one um, is about uh, using some novel uh, uh, method to improve the mobility um, of waxy oil at low temperature. So this has uh, the third product. It has potential application um, in, the, in the Asia and Africa region where the waxy oil could have higher a poor point and, uh, it's, and it's very difficult to transport. So now, um, so the, I would like to start with my first work, uh, which is about a fundamental wax deposition model uh, in a single phase pipe flow. Now, before I talk about the technical details, I'd like to briefly introduce uh, what wax is. So the wax, uh, also called a paraffin wax, uh, refers to a mixture of normal or linear alkanes with carbon number um, higher than 17. And this carbon number could go as high as a 90, uh, but in most cases uh, it stops around C50 or C60. Um, so the so wax is a natural component of many crude oils and the gas condensate uh, people found so far. And uh, the wax content uh, in those petroleums could vary from as low as 0.5 weight percent to as high as uh, 30 weight percent. So just like every uh, most many things that we have seen in our daily life, uh, the solubility uh, of wax in the oil will be reduced at lower temperature. So this is the root for all wax issue we have observed so far. So as you can see from this uh, solubility chart here, now at higher temperature, um, then the wax will be well dissolved in the oil. So as you can see, uh, this is a picture of the model wax oil and at high temperature, uh, the oil is transparent. Uh, so there's no wax precipitation and there's no wax issue. However, once we reduce the temperature uh, below uh, a threshold, uh, which we call a wax appearance temperature, now as you can see, the wax will start to precipitate out and then the oil will become opaque. Um, and then if we go further, uh, if, if the temperature is, uh, is lower, then we get a significant wax precipitation and then as you can see the oil becomes uh, uh, immobile and then it's, it's very uh, has very high viscosity and then we have all kinds of wax issue uh, under these conditions. <clears throat> now uh, the general background for this work is about subsea transportation uh, of waxy oil. So normally the waxy oil enters the subsea pipeline at a relatively high temperature. Um, so under this condition, the wax is well dissolved in oil. However, the seafloor or the seabed uh, has a very low temperature, well below the wax appearance temperature. So during the transportation, um, the dissolved wax uh, will start to precipitate out and form uh, this deposit inside the pipe and, uh, and block uh, the pipeline. So here is um, uh, some animation to explain uh, uh, in detail about the wax deposition mechanism. So here we have a pipeline and the oil, this is the oil flow direction. Now, so as the hot, hot oil is flowing uh, through the cold pipeline, it will lose heat to the surroundings. So the wax very near uh, to the pipe wall uh, will precipitate out first to form uh, this initial deposit layer. Now this initial layer um, um, will cause a concentration difference in the dissolved wax molecules. So basically we have a higher concentration uh, of the dissolved wax in the center line compared to the near wall region. So this concentration difference will drive, um, uh, will drive the wax molecules to diffuse from the center line to the pipe wall. And once they reach uh, the existing uh, deposit layer, so they will precipitate out and form the new, uh, new uh, uh, deposit. So then we are seeing an uh, increase in the deposit thickness. Now, one thing about the structure about, uh, of the de deposit is that we have uh, the deposit has a gel structure. So basically, we, it consists of uh, wax crystals, 
connecting with each other to form a crystal network uh, with some oil trapped between these wax crystals. Now, those trapped oil can provide a medium for the wax molecule to further diffuse into the deposit. And once they precipitate out, precipitate out inside the deposit, uh, then that will increase the overall wax fraction uh, of the deposit, which is uh, uh, which is uh, the process we call aging. So in other words, over time, not only does the deposit thickness increase, um, uh, its wax content is also increasing, so the deposit is becoming harder and harder and becoming, uh, it's becoming more difficult to remove. Now, in order to simulate uh, uh, this process, um, so we have to um, first understand uh, the temperature distribution uh, inside the system because temperature is a major driving force for uh, wax crystallization and precipitation. Now, to simulate this process, uh, we can um, solve the temperature profile by numerically solving the simplified uh, 2D heat transfer equation. So we are making several assumptions here. Now, we are assuming the pseudo steady state approximation. Basically, that means um, the rate uh, for the heat and the mass transfer is much, much faster uh, compared to the rate of deposition. So basically, we can separate um, the heat transfer and the mass transfer with the deposition process. Now, if we assume the velocity uh, is 1D, um, uh, we have a 1D velocity profile for pipe flow, and then because a pipe is symmetric in theta direction, so basically we get a simplified heat transfer equation like this. Now, we are using uh, a thermal, add thermal diffusivity here um, just to account for uh, any heat transfer uh, effect caused by the turbulence. Uh, once we apply the proper boundary condition and then uh, a, uh, a proper numerical scheme, we can solve this equation and then to get the temperature profile um, as a function of the radial position and the axial position. And so once we know the heat transfer or the temperature profile, the next task or next step is to figure out uh, the concentration profile. Now the concentration here remains, uh, refers to the concentration of the dissolved wax inside the system. And again, we can get this concentration profile by solving the mass transfer equation. So this mass transfer equation is analogous uh, in many ways to the heat transfer equation, but the only difference is that we have a bulk precipitation uh, term here uh, just to account for any bulk precipitation. So if the temperature of the bulk or of the oil is below the wax appearance temperature, then we could have wax crystals forming in the bulk uh, and those wax crystals will just flow together with oil and they will not contribute in any way to uh, the deposition process. So that's why we will have to uh, exclude this box precipitation from our uh, mass balance equation. Now here I'm just using a, a first order uh, reaction, uh, basically including a reaction constant uh, multiplied by the, con uh, by the difference between the real concentration and the concentration of the wax um, under the thermodynamic equilibrium condition. And again, we can apply the boundary condition and then solve the concentration um, um, of the dissolved wax at different radial position and axial position. Now, so once we know uh, the temperature profile and the concentration profile, we can then move on to solve um, uh, the thickness increase rate. So uh, remember I said, so at the interface, we have two different uh, mass flux. So um, the mass flux J1, that is, uh, that accounts for everything um, that diffuse to the interface and the J2 that accounts for the part of um, uh, mass flux um, that um, diffuse into the deposit. So if we write down the mass balance equation uh, on the interface, now we could have um, difference between uh, J1 and J2. So that is the difference between these two terms uh, that is responsible for the thickness increase uh, the D delta DT, that is the thickness inc increase rate. 
Um, and then we could have uh, the J2 uh, that accounts for the increase in the wax fraction, which is the D FW DT uh, term here. So if we combine uh, every equation, everything we have talked about so far and solve them numerically um, together, then the model will output uh, how the thickness and the wax fraction is changing over time. Now we validated our model uh, by doing uh, the flow loop test. Um, so here is a schematic of the flow loop apparatus. Basically, we are circulating the oil through a closed system using a pump, and we have a heat exchanger to control the oil temperature. And in the test section, uh, we have a pipe in pipe configuration. So the coolant uh, is flowing through the annulus uh, so that we are cr creating a temperature difference between the oil and the surroundings in the test section. So we could have uh, that will induce a wax deposition inside the, inside the test section. So this um, setup will be uh, is used so to simulate the wax deposition scenario in the field. Now we have conducted more than 50 uh, flow loop tests using both a lab scale test and a pilot scale test. And we use a variety of different oils, model oil, crude oils, condensate, and we test, um, we, we did the test at different operation conditions. Now here is a one example of uh, the comparison between models um, and experiments. So we are. Uh, uh, so what, what I'm plotting here is the effective radius, uh, which is the ratio of the flowable radius to the pipe radius. So at initial uh, point, then we don't have a deposition. So we have a one for the effective radius, and as time goes on, then the effective radius will be decreasing over time, indicating the formation of wax deposit. And uh, what I'm in also included here is a wax fraction. Uh, measured at different time and uh, the red curve is for the models and the black curve is for experiments and again so the dots are for experimentally measured wax fraction and the blue curve is a modeled uh, wax fraction so as you can see the model can capture the trend um, of both uh, thickness and uh, the wax fraction pretty well and uh, so both the thickness and the wax fraction will change faster uh, initially followed by a more gradual change later. So this is because uh, so once the deposit is formed in the test section, then the deposit layer can function as a insulation layer that will reduce the heat transfer uh, and mass transfer between the oil and the surroundings. So we don't have a very strong driving force at the later stage of experiments compared to the initial stage of the experiment. And here is another comparison for turbulent flow. Uh, even though for turbulent flow, we are seeing a very uh, a more constant fluctuation in, in the experimental data due to probably a shear sloughing effects. But again, we can see the overall, uh, the, the model can still capture the trend and uh, basically the average thickness pretty well. Now, in addition to uh, the lab testing, we also applied uh, the model to a field case. So this is a hypothetical uh, field uh, test uh, with a 70 kilometer pipeline. Um, and as you can see, uh, we can divide this entire pipe into three different regions. Now, um, <clears throat> now uh, in this early uh, uh, stage, basically we have no wax precipitation. That is because uh, the oil temperature is still very high. Uh, well above wax appearance temperature, so there's no wax precipitation or deposition. And then we entered this um, a very uh, severe wax deposition ratio, uh, sorry, wax deposition region. Um, and then we are seeing a very a bad wax deposition um, in this distance. And then at the later, at the longer distance, then we, are, we can see the deposition uh, thickness is reduced uh, due to the reduced, uh, due to uh, the reduced uh, heat transfer between the oil and the surroundings. Now, so the one um, one application of this res result is that suppose now we want to do some maintenance 
uh, or some pigging of the pipe uh, under this operating condition, we know that we should really focus on um, uh, this, uh, the distance between 10 to 20 kilometers instead of the entire pipe. Uh, so that could save some energy and help, I mean, make the operation more efficient in the field. Now here, uh, we also applied uh, the model to study um, to study the depos deposition tendency when we have different oil property. Now here we are, so here is a solubility chart for three different, uh, different types of oil. Uh, so we have two crude oil from the field and then the black curve, that is uh, a model oil we prepared in the lab. So as you can see, the different oils have different uh, precipitation um, features. Now it has different uh, wax appearance temperature and then it has different slope and uh, so the curves have a different behavior. Now, once we run the simulation, so this is uh, what we see, uh, we can actually uh, cross-check this sickness profile with, uh, with uh, the solubility chart. So as you can see, because of the blue curve here, it has uh, the highest uh, wax appearance temperature. So that's why the onset location for the, for the uh, blue curve, that is the earliest. And now if we compare the initial slope of the curve, um, the, the initial slope is just the initial precipitation rate uh, of wax, and we can see the, the black curve has the highest slope. Um, so that's why we are seeing this a uh, very large peak uh, for the for the black oil uh, for, for the for, for the for the black curve. So basically, uh, so that means so the model uh, is capturing the physics. Uh, in the right way and we can rely on its prediction to get our operation. So as a final touch, um, we turned this model into a commercial software. Uh, we call that a Michigan uh, wax predictor. So this basically, this is a work, uh, uh, most of the work I did when I was a PhD student uh, at the University of Michigan. Uh, so this is uh, the user interface. Um, as you can see, the interface will take pipeline information operating condition, crude oil, uh, some thermodynamic behavior of the oil uh, as an input, and then it will generate um, uh, a thickness and the wax fraction over time. So now to conclude the first project, um, so we have a de deposition model to, um, to predict um, uh, the thickness and the wax fraction under single phase pipe flow condition. Now we validated this model in more than 50 lab scale, pilot scale tests. And then we also use this model to study the deposition feature under field condition. And uh, finally, we developed a commercial simulator uh, for, industry, for industry use. Now I move on to the second work, uh, which is about the rheological property of the gelled waxy oil. So the general industry background of this work is about the pipeline shutdown and the restart operation. So sometimes we will have to uh, shut down the transportation due to maintenance or emergency. Now, if that happens, uh, the oil will stop flowing and it can become a gel inside the system due to a wax precipitation. Um, now, in order to resume the flow and to re restart, the pipeline, we have to know how much pressure we need to apply uh, to break the gel. So then in this work, we will use the tool of rheology to understand uh, how the waxy gel is responding to external forces. Now, just a, a little bit back the introduction about the rheology. Basically, rheology starts, studies the flow and deformation of matter. Uh, so the instrument we use is called a rheometer. Uh, there are basically two ways we can do this. We can apply a force uh, or a stress to the sample and measure its deformation. Um, or we can also apply uh, a certain amount of deformation uh, to the sample and then measure how much stress or how much force is required to induce uh, this deformation. And now, uh, this corresponds to stress controlled rheometer and the strain controlled rheometer. And uh, we used, uh, for this work, we used uh, a wax crude oil with about 22% uh, wax content. 
um, uh, then we just uh, we heat the oil to high uh, at high temperature to dissolve any wax, and then cool the, cool down the oil to the testing temperature, and then we just apply different protocols uh, to study uh, the behaviors uh, of the gel from different perspective. Now this is um, about the viscoelasticity of the gel. Uh, in a creep recovery test. Now in this test, we applied a constant stress for a while and then removed the stress um, to let the sample recover and we measure uh, how the deformation of the gel uh, is changing over time. Uh, so as you can see, um, basically, uh, if when we applied different um, uh, stress magnitude, the behavior share uh, the curve share very similar behavior, so there will be initial there will be an initial elastic response, and then there will be a, a delayed elastic response, and then um, finally we will have the steady state of viscous response. Here only the viscosity is playing a role here, and now in the recovery stage we have um, an initial recovery, um, instant recovery followed by a delayed recovery, and finally almost all the elastic deformation will be recovered, but uh, the viscous deformation will be dissipated as heat and they will not be um, recovered after the test. Now, in this plot, uh, we are applying a much larger uh, stress. So as you can see, we can divide the curves into three different regions based on the behavior. Now, if we use a very small stress, uh, so this is the, if we zoom in here, we will observe uh, the typical um, uh, viscoelastic behavior um, in this plot. Uh, however, if we apply a larger stress, uh, we are breaking the gel. So as you can see, at a certain point, uh, the strain or the deformation of the gel will increase sharply. And this transition point, that is my yielding point. And, um, and then if we apply a very large stress to the sample, then we just crush the gel almost instantly. We are not able to see a clear transition uh, from solid to the liquid. And another interesting we found from this plot is that even though the gel will yield at different time when we have different stress, but the yielding strain, which is the strain uh, at the yielding point, is almost independent of the, of the stress we applied. Basically, that means um, so no matter uh, how we apply the stress, the sample or the gel will yield as long as it reaches this critical yielding strain. So this is another way to study the viscoelasticity. Uh, here we apply oscillatory strain and we measure the moduli, uh, the elastic uh, storage modulus and uh, loss modulus. Uh, of the sample, and that mean that uh, that will tell us the elasticity and the vis viscosity of the sample. So as you can see, at low strain, um, basically we have a more solid-like system. So we have uh, the G prime is higher than the G double prime. So we have uh, the such system behaves more like like a solid. But at a certain point, if we uh, increase the strain, then we we are seeing the yielding uh, of the sample now. After that, uh, we are seeing the, the sample behaves, uh, the system behaves more like a liquid like uh, than the solid like. So we are seeing the G double prime becomes higher than the G prime at this uh, larger uh, strain uh, range. So finally, it's about fixotropy and the shear thinning. Um, now we here we are measuring the viscosity of the sample um, at different shear rate. So we observe that the viscosity not only depends on the magnitude of the shear uh, rate, it also depends on how long the shear is applied to the system. So as you can see, if we compare um, the, sh uh, the viscosity at different shear rate, then we are seeing a lower viscosity at higher shear rate. Uh, that is uh, a behavior uh, called a shear thinning behavior. And we are at a constant shear rate now so viscosity is also gradually decreasing uh, over time. So this is another rheological behavior um, 
um, called thixotropy. So that means if we apply, if we are, that means if we apply a larger shear stress to the sample uh, for longer time, uh, that will be more effective in breaking the gel uh, and improve the, uh, the mobility of the system. Now, um, to conclude the second project, uh, the, this work is mainly about the rheological behavior of the gelled waxy oil. Uh, so we found, we studied the visco viscoelasticity, sexotropy, and the shear thinning behavior. And we found uh, a linear viscoelastic region and smaller deformation. And even though the yielding of the gelled waxy oil depend, um, um, depends on both the magnitude and time of the applied stress, and um, but the yield strain uh, that is almost independent of how the stress is applied. Now, finally, I want to talk about a very uh, recent work that I did about using electric uh, magnetic field to improve the low temperature mobility of the waxy oil. Now, the background of this work is about the waxy oil will have high viscosity um, at low temperature, so it will require much higher power uh, or, uh, to transport um, uh, the low temperature waxy oil. Um, so the conventional method to improve this, uh, to treat those issues, it, uh, it include either apply uh, the thermal method. Basically, we heat the pipe to um, um, to above the wax appearance temperature so that we can reduce uh, we can reduce its viscosity, or we can try to add some chemicals to the system uh, to modify um, uh, uh, the thermodynamic behavior of wax crystallization. But those methods, uh, they are usually uh, uh, costly and they are not always working well. So over the year, people have been trying to figure, uh, find out um, um, whether there are some more efficient and cost-effective ways to improve the mobility of waxy oil. So now in this work, we tried uh, the electric field uh, to just to achieve uh, to, to achieve this purpose. So this is the apparatus we use. Uh, we have an oil tank and uh, we can apply the nitrogen to pressurize the oil and to force it to flow down uh, into a small uh, into a small tube. And now uh, in the middle of the tube, we have two electrodes. Uh, we have those small holes uh, on the metal electrodes for the oil to pass through and we can apply um, uh, different power uh, different uh, power or voltage to the electrode basic and then we are applying a different electric field strength to the oil as it passes through these electrodes the oil will finally flow down into a beaker and uh, we can use a balance or scale to measure how fast uh, basically measure the flow rate of the oil and then calculate, uh, back calculate the viscosity of the oil before and after the treatment. Now the entire apparatus will be covered by the water bath to maintain uh, a desired temperature. So this is a, uh, the right picture, that is a, a real picture of our apparatus. Now for the data processing, um, so we can back calculate the viscosity of the oil before and after treatment using the non-Newtonian uh, fluid mechanics. Uh, basically, this is a key equation we are going to use, which shows the effective uh, 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 viscosity depends on the shear rate and the two parameters K and N. And once we rearrange all those equations and the plot the shear stress term versus this term. So V here is average velocity and D here is my pipe diameter. So if I plot these two terms um, on a, a double log uh, plot, I will get a straight line here. And then from the slope and the intercept of this straight line, we can calculate uh, the constant K and N. And then basically once we plug in K and N into this equation, we can uh, estimate the viscosity at different uh, shear rate. So we also defined a parameter called viscosity reduction, uh, which is basically the relative uh, viscosity change before and after uh, the treatment. And we will use this quantity to evaluate the performance of electric field and the different operating condition. 
Now, as you can see here, we are showing the viscosity reduction at different temperature and different fuel strengths. Now, for the different temperature, interesting see uh, one interesting thing we, we observe is that so at higher temperature, uh, higher than the wax appearance temperature, basically we are not seeing any improvement. So as you can see, uh, the viscosity reduction is basically zero um, at higher temperature. Um, however, once we lower the temperature below the wax appearance temperature, then we have some wax crystals uh, in the system. And now we are seeing this a uh, big uh, effect of electric field um, before and after the treatment. So the highest viscosity reduction we observe for this uh, particular type of oil is about 70% uh, viscosity reduction at, uh, at the lowest uh, temperature we studied, which is quite impressive. And also uh, we, try, we, 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 we measured the viscosity reduction at different fuel strengths uh, when the temperature is controlled as constant. Uh, so at, just as expected, uh, so if we apply a larger or a, or a higher fuel strength, we get a higher viscosity reduction. However, we cannot go as high as we want. So after a certain point, we will have an electrical breakdown uh, in the system. So that will, uh, we will no longer apply higher uh, voltage to the system after we pass uh, the breakdown point. So basically, again, as you can see, this is the highest uh, viscosity reduction here is uh, still about 70%. Um, for this system. Now, another thing we explore is to see, okay, the oil has many different components. Uh, so the asphaltines are some of the highest and the most polar components in the system. So we want to see whether the presence of asphaltines um, can, uh, how, how the presence of asphaltine will influence um, the performance we, uh, we observe for the waxy oil. So we just prepared a different model oil system and uh, different oils contains a different um, weight, weight, uh, weight fraction of the asphaltine. And uh, so as you can see, so we are, we are compare, uh, we compare the viscosity at the same amount of precipitated uh, wax. So basically we have the same amount of wax crystals in the system, uh, but then uh, the asphaltine content will be also different. So what we see surprisingly is that the presence of asphaltine have a negative uh, impact uh, on the electrical treatment. So basically when we have a higher asphaltine in the system, a higher amount of asphaltine in the system, we are seeing a very, uh, we are seeing a lower uh, viscosity reduction rate. So this is a very interesting, right now we are still not, we're still trying to understand uh, the reason for this observation, but we thought uh, it has something to do with um, um, with asphaltine modifying the crystal network formed by wax crystals. In other words, even though the total amount of wax crystals are the same, um, but the wax crystals um, will connect with each other in a different way, so the crystal structure will be different when we have different amount of asphaltine in the system, that will lead to different um, different performance of the electric treatment. Okay, so the next thing we saw is, okay, we are seeing, uh, we saw the electric treatment can reduce the viscosity. Can, can, we also, can, 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 can we also see the similar effect once the oil becomes a gel? So again, we studied uh, the G prime and the D double prime of, um, of the gel that has been treated by electric treatment. And as we can see, um, once we apply a higher strength, then the G prime and the G double prime are both lower, meaning that the gel is more um, is much softer and uh, is easier to break. And again, here um, in the in the real, uh, in the creep recovery test, so as you can see, uh, the black curve is untreated oil and the red curve is a treated oil uh, at the highest uh, strength. As you can see, if we apply the same stress, uh, the same force. To the sample, then the treated oil will have a much higher deformation, and um, and then most of the deformation will not be able to recover after the test. So that tells us the gel is easier to, it's much easier to break, and uh, it's less stable. And again here, uh, so we are measuring the yield stress of the sample after, um, um, 
um, after the electric treatment. So basically, as you can see, um, once the sample has been treated, higher strength, then it has much, much lower um, yield stress. So that means the electric treatment does not only have potential application for uh, risk of viscosity reduction, it might also uh, have application for the restart uh, operation. So finally, this is um, basically to understand so how long this effect can last. So basically, we, when we apply some um, elect, uh, we apply electric field to the sample, and then we, we monitor how the viscosity is changing over time. So as you can see, the longest um, um, time we observe is that the effect can last about as long as 80 hours, um, and we, with a constant uh, a shear um, shearing. So that means if we apply a constant disturbance of the sample, that will prevent uh, the crystals uh, from restoring to the, its original um, configuration so that we can maintain um, uh, the, the viscosity uh, reduction effect as long as possible. Now, to summarize this final project, uh, we get some uh, very impressive achievement here. Uh, so we found that electric field can reduce both the low temperature viscosity and the strength um, of the waxy oils. And uh, we found that the precipitated wax crystals are uh, the major uh, reason for the electric field to be effective. And uh, the presence of other uh, polar components such as asphaltines or resins can reduce uh, the effects caused by electric field. And we observed a maximum of 70% of viscosity reduction and it can last for about 80 hours. So in addition to these three works, I also did some other related projects. Uh, so I, I, I grouped them based on the problems. So we used the model we developed uh, to study, uh, to clarify the mechanism of different, uh, the effect of operating condition on wax deposition. And we also uh, used, uh, we studied rheology of the gel when we have different um, uh, components are present in the system. And finally, along the electric treatment line. Um, so we just started this work and now we are investigating to see whether we can add some functional molecule uh, to the system that can strengthen, uh, further strengthen uh, the electric um, uh, field uh, improvement effect that we, all, we observe um, in the system. Now, just a briefly, uh, uh, um, some idea about the future direction. So now in the future, I like to start expand my past research in two directions. So the first uh, the one direction, we're going to look at uh, the multi-phase uh, flow. So that is a more practical for field application. And on another scale, uh, we will try to look at the problems at a smaller length scale. So we are trying to go down to molecular scale and using some advanced simulation techniques such as particle dynamic simulation or molecular dynamic simulation to understand how the wax molecules aggregate to wax crystals and how the crystals aggregate with each other to form the network. Now, if we have a better understanding of this fundamental uh, physics, that will help us to manage the situation and more and uh, develop more effective chemicals um, to control the wax issue. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge um, some of the great uh, scholars I have worked with and some of the students uh, that uh, contributed to the work and now the work None of this work will be possible without a sponsor from uh, University of Michigan Industrial Affiliates Program, NS of China, uh, China National Petroleum Cooperation, and Tulsa Paraffin Deposition Projects. And I also want to thank the center, CSE Center, for giving me this chance to talk about my research. And, um, and thank you very much for uh, your time, and I'm happy to take any questions you have. So on slide 16 and 17, uh, what were the matching parameters, and if any, also in the first project, can you not using um, any existing CFT software such as Comso? Um, so I suppose the dynamic thickness 
change would be a challenge. OK, so there are two questions here. So, so the first one is about um, the slide 16 and 17. OK, so I believe this is the slide you were uh, talking about. Um, so, so, so I'm not sure exactly what you mean by matching parameter, but I think uh, you mean uh, you mean the, the the parameter I'm trying to compare between uh, experiments and the simulation. So basically, um, we we only compared. So now in this uh, now in this plot, uh, we just compared the uh, the deposition thickness. Now uh, is now in this plot it is expressed as the effective radius, which is uh, the ratio of the flowable radius to the pipe radius. Um, so this is just another way to express the real thickness. And another parameter we are trying to match is the wax fraction. So basically, um, so after, um, after, after uh, uh, for different test duration, we just stop the test and measure the wax, total wax fraction of the formed deposit. And then uh, we compare uh, we compare the thick, uh, um, what uh, this uh, the, the experiments are showing and what uh, the simulation is predicting. So, and uh, here, uh, this is just uh, the input of the, so this is condition, uh, uh, the test is conducted. This is the oil temperature, coolant temperature, and Reynolds number, and we use the same input for the model. And of course, the model could also generate the temperature profile and the and um, and uh, the concentration profile, but that is more like intermediate results. Uh, but uh, it is only the final results, uh, the thickness and the wax fraction we can compare between experiments and the simulation. Now, regarding your second question about the software, now we are not we are not using any commercial software, um, so. Uh, we just use Fortran um, or MATLAB to code uh, our model, and then we just um, we we just use our we just code by ourselves, uh, and then to to numerically solve uh, those equations. So basically, we are not relying on any commercial software. Uh, there's a follow up to that. Uh, let me read it to you. Sure. Um, uh, I meant, does the model as is match the actual data? Do you not calibrate any parameters to match the actual data? Thanks. Oh, OK. Um, now, the, the, the only tuning parameter. Uh, so we have in the model is uh, this KR term here, so which is the precipitation rate constant. Uh, so this is the only tuning parameter we have in the model and then um, and uh, in addition to that, we don't have any other tuning parameter. So most of the other parameter we use are either material property or, um, or, uh, or some a correlation, such as we use some correlation to predict uh, the, the diffusivity of the wax, but we are not, we are not trying to match. Uh, we don't have any other tuning parameter in the, in, in, inside the model. Question, so you showed this wax have a yield stress. Uh, did you model it using a Bingham or a, a plastic model? Um, so, so when we uh, when we um, when we um, predict the wax deposition, uh, we are not using any non-Newtonian uh, dynamics model. Basically, we just use a, a polynomial fit to fit the viscosity uh, curve um, of the system. Uh, because um, in order to for the non-Newtonian effect to be significant, the temperature has to be relatively low, and um, especially um, so for the wax deposition scenario, when the oil is flowing, uh, we are not seeing a very significant um, non-Newtonian behavior. However, if we want to simulate the restart of the gelled pipeline, we for sure should uh, consider the non-Newtonian or yield stress of the sample, uh, but that is not um, what I'm trying to uh, model uh, in, the, in my first product. Basically, the first product only targets about uh, wax deposition in flowing condition. What are the practical challenge um, of imposing an electric field? Um, so, so um, I'm now, so basically, 
for that work, we just started recently and we are not there far yet. Um, so basically everything is uh, we did is in very small uh, test scale. We haven't thought about how uh, we can apply uh, a very uh, electric field in large scale, but my guess would be um, so the practical challenge is basically to to predict um, what effect can be generated using the electric field, and also um, if the the system has some water uh, residual or some has some water content, I th I thought that could be a potential issue um, if we want to apply a very high uh, electric field to a system containing water. Um, but we are trying to do some fundamental study to see um, what is the effect of water or some other uh, components and uh, what is the highest water content we could have um, in the system without, without, without causing any uh, safety or breakdown issue. But, but, but anyway, but I think these are some of the problems I could think of. Um, but we are still um, trying to uh, figure out some fundamental mechanisms and um, reasons for the for the observations we saw. If you have any other question or uh, if you'd like to know more about my research, just please feel free to contact me, and I'm happy to uh, talk about my other research in more details. And um, yeah, thank you very much for your time, and thank you for participating uh, uh, this webinar.